It is common in the history of warfare to intimidate your foe by means of deception. For example, during World War II, the Allies placed inflatable tanks on the battlefield to make the enemy think they were confronting a more formidable foe. One could say that the Apollo bluff worked, as there never was a nuclear war. Yet, no one has ever come forward and actually admitted to this deception long after the Cold War hostilities have ceased. I don't care what you say. I went to the moon and back, and everyone that's a scientist knows it. Now, if you want to not believe it, it's okay, you know? It's okay. It's a better story. It's ju it just happens to be a lie. That's all. I, I, I probably would have done what the other six did because I'm just as stubborn as anybody else. I said, I don't need to prove to you that I went to the moon. I know I went. Well, I know for a fact you didn't walk on the moon. I've that's seen the fine. Footage. That's fine. It's okay if you know it. Do you understand that? <laughs> you can have any opinion you want. That's what's wonderful about this country. You can believe anything you want. And it's okay with me, for sure. Right. The most common question asked is how so many people could have been kept quiet about it. One wonders, too, why the astronauts would go along with such an elaborate hoax. To answer this question, we must all return to World War II Germany. Under Adolf Hitler's leadership, a Nazi war criminal named Werner von Braun built thousands of V-2 rockets through slave labor that were launched against London. Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. Some have harsh words for this man of renown, but some think our attitude should be one of gratitude, like the widows and cripples in old London town, who owe their large pensions to Werner von Braun. After the war, the Soviets and the Americans divided up the rocket technology. The Americans brought home over 100 top Nazi propulsion specialists, including their leading rocket scientist, von Braun. Since most people wanted to come live in America, the Soviet Union was given most of the hardware, which, to a large degree, contributed to their victory with Sputnik. In German or English, I know how to count down. And I'm learning Chinese, says Werner von Braun. By 1961, Nazi rocket scientists such as von Braun maintained a close relationship with President John F. Kennedy as he moved to fulfill his promise to land Americans on the moon before the end of 1969. Yet today, NASA says it will be 2018 before we go back to the moon, despite having supposedly been there over 35 years ago. It is time for America to take the next steps. Today I announce a new plan to explore space and extend a human presence across our solar system. We will begin the effort quickly using existing programs and personnel. We'll make steady progress. One mission, one voyage, one landing at a time. Our third goal is to return to the moon by 2020 as the launching point for missions beyond. Beginning no later than 2008, we will send a series of robotic missions to the lunar surface to research and prepare for future human exploration. Using the crew exploration vehicle, we will undertake extended human missions to the moon as early as 2015, with the goal of living and working there for increasingly extended periods of time. Would we ever consider it reasonable if there were a 40-year span between the first and second trips across the Atlantic Ocean? Why such a late date? In 1953, Von Braun wrote a book on how to get to the moon, titled Conquest of the Moon. On page 14 of his book, he states, It is commonly believed that man will fly directly from the Earth to the moon, but to do this, we would require a vehicle of such gigantic proportions that it would prove an economic impossibility. 
It would have to develop sufficient speed to penetrate the atmosphere and overcome the Earth's gravity, and, having traveled all the way to the moon, it must still have enough fuel to land safely and make the return trip to Earth. Furthermore, in order to give the expedition a margin of safety, we would not use one ship alone, but a minimum of three. Calculations have been carefully worked out on the type of vehicle we would need for the non-stop flight from the Earth to the Moon in return. The figures speak for themselves. Each rocket ship would be taller than New York's Empire State Building, 1,250 feet, and weigh about 10 times the tonnage of the Queen Mary, or some 800,000 tons. The Apollo program's three-stage Saturn V was only 3,000 tons. The Saturn V was 266 times smaller than it had to be. Von Braun was certain that the way to get to the moon would first require that a space station be built, with the rocket parts being ferried there for final construction. Our first goal is to complete the International Space Station by 2010. We will finish what we have started. We will meet our obligations to our 15 international partners on this project. We will focus our future research aboard the station on the long-term effects of space travel on human biology. Research on board the station and here on Earth will help us better understand and overcome the obstacles that limit exploration. Through these efforts, we will develop the skills and techniques necessary to sustain further space exploration. The constructed vehicle would then launch from the Earth's orbit rather than its surface. The Saturn V used only three fuels, liquid oxygen and kerosene in the first stage, and liquid oxygen and hydrogen in the upper stages. No exotic new fuels were invented to bring down the fuel requirement. Also, the space shuttle has 30% less mass at liftoff than did the Saturn V. We have ignition and liftoff of Atlantis and the Galileo spacecraft bound for Jupiter. Yet has never attempted to travel beyond the 400 mile altitude. With Kennedy's promise, the space race was in full swing. Yet it became apparent in the mid-60s that there was absolutely no way anything of the sort was going to happen. Following in Commander Shepard's star-studded footsteps came Captain Virgil Grissom. Everything is A-OK -okay until the heartbreaking finale. As the captain prepared to leave the capsule, explosive bolts on the escape hatch let go, and the Mercury is lost. However, the moon gets closer. The leading astronaut of the day, Gus Grissom, was slated to be the first man to walk on the moon. He was an outspoken man with the highest level of integrity. There was no way he would lie for anyone. He was also an outspoken critic of the dilapidated state of the moon program. Just before he died, he hung a lemon on the capsule and held a press conference in which he pointed out the sad state of the program. On the morning he died, upon having difficulty communicating from the capsule, he angrily asked, Hey, how are you going to get the moon if we can't talk between three buildings? In 1967, during a plugs-out test in which no engines were even ignited, they had him in a sealed capsule and pressurized it with 100% pure oxygen. A fire erupted, and all three astronauts perished. After this grisly incident, no other astronaut dared to criticize the program. And after all these years of lying and making their livings off the fame, none chooses to wreck this acclaimed success for the others by telling the truth. There is strong reason to doubt the fire was accidental. Page 81 of the Apollo 1 Accident Investigation Report, issued by the U.S. Congress, reveals that prior to the fire, NASA, by their own admission, were very well aware of the respective fires at the Johnsville Navy Air Station and Brooks Air Force Base. The fires in question, as pointed out by author Ralph Rene, were a result of sparks and even static electricity igniting the pure oxygen environments. In spite of these past fatalities, 
NASA used a 100% oxygen atmosphere in the Apollo 1 spacecraft, arguing that they had done it previously on the Gemini program. Of course,